This is the Floridaville. Get to know the people behind the Florida names you know. I'm your host, Rosanna Catalano. On this episode, we get to know State Representative Spencer Roach. He is a foster parent, world traveler, and a retired Coast Guard officer. He talks to us about his beginnings as a plumber's assistant, the weight of making decisions for the 21 million people living in Florida, and even tells us about his nickname, La Cucaracha. We're here in Florida's capital city, and our guest today is Representative Spencer Roach. Welcome to the show. Good morning, Roe. Thank you for having me. Representative Roach, you represent District 79. Can you tell our listeners where District 79 is in Florida and what areas you represent? Sure. District 79 is one of only two districts in the entire state of Florida that's 100% unincorporated, meaning that I, I represent no cities or municipalities in my district. The district is located wholly within Lee County. It includes the unincorporated communities of North Fort Myers, Fort Myers Shores, Olga, Alva, Lehigh, and Buckingham. And it runs all the way east to the Hendry County line and all the way north to the Charlotte County line. Did you always know you were going to run for office? No, definitely. I don't know that anyone could ever know that they're going to do this. I did envision myself playing a role somehow in the process, whether as working on campaigns or uh, possibly working as a consultant or as some kind of advocacy group or possibly running for office myself. What inspired you to do it? In insanity, Ro. Um, <laughs> no, I've been interested and engaged in politics probably since a young age, early 20s, I would say, and I worked on a few campaigns. I started in this business, as many people do, as an intern. I ended up managing a state house campaign for a state rep at one point. I worked uh, as a congressional staffer for about a year, and a seat opened up in the area where I was living in southwest Florida. And some friends of mine and local elected leaders approached me several times about the possibility of running for the seat. First two times I was approached, I declined, and I helped them find some other candidates who, uh, for various reasons, did not end up working out. And as they say, the third time is the charm. And they asked me the third time, and I, I said, yes, I'll take a shot at it, put my name in the hat. Did it the old-fashioned way. I say grassroots support and shoe leather. Knocked on 5,000 doors personally in the primary with no volunteers, and we won. We made it through to the general. Your first legislative session was in 2019. Was there anything about that process that took you by surprise? Well, I'm constantly surprised in this business. I like to talk about the transition from campaigning into actually getting elected and being a representative. I mentioned knocking on doors earlier, but one thing you find, you know, you work so hard and so long to get across the finish line. In my case, you campaign for you know, probably 18 months for the seat. You spend a lot of time out in the Florida summer knocking on doors, just sort of hoping that someone will answer the door and talk to you. You're doing a lot of dialing for dollars, hoping that someone will answer the phone and at least hear you out. And the Florida Constitution provides that legislators take office upon election. So as soon as the res results are certified, uh, you're a representative. And uh, really overnight, you go from being sort of a sweaty mess on someone's doorstep and just hoping that they open the door to a representative. And uh, all of a sudden, you have two offices, you have a staff, uh, you have a title, you have a vote on a $90 billion budget. Uh, I found that I was much taller, I was smarter, my jokes were funnier, I had a lot more friends. You know, I think if you're not well-grounded, that, that can go to your head. Um, and if I can tell you just a, a little piece about you coming up to Tallahassee for the first time as a, as a newly elected representative, um, they brought us up to the House for a two-day orientation period within two weeks of, of the election results being certified. There were 27 new members of my class that got elected in 2018. And uh, the second day of that orientation process, uh, the Speaker of the House, the, the Speaker designated at the time, Jose Oliva, ushered us onto the House floor for the, for the first time. And there's just sort of a feeling of reverence that settled over all of us as, as we entered the chamber. Now as members, after having worked so long to get here, and Speaker Oliva is a man I would describe as almost extreme brevity. He's not given to superfluous language, but when he speaks, his words uh, carry a great import. And, and he brought us in, asked us to find our desk, gave us all of a three-minute speech, but I'll never forget what he said. He said, Representatives, I'd like for you to sit down at your desk Take a look at the red and green buttons on your desk. I would like you to keep in mind that every time you push one of those red or green buttons, you're affecting the lives of 21 million Floridians. And if that ever becomes easy for you to do, then it's time for you to go home. And I, I have kept that uh, in, in the front of my mind every time I sit down and push that button either way, that on the other end of that vote is someone's children, someone's grandchildren, someone's livelihood, 
uh, that we're impacting our fellow citizens. So I, I, I'm always mindful of that. What committees do you currently serve on for the 2020 session? So, Ro, I am uh, I'm healthcare heavy. I serve on three healthcare committees. I serve on the full Health and Human Services Committee. I serve on the Healthcare Appropriations Committee, and uh, I serve on Children, Families, and Seniors, which is a great passion of mine. I serve on the Criminal Justice Subcommittee, which does some very interesting and engaging work, and I serve on the uh, Workforce Development and Tourism uh, Subcommittee. It's a lot of committees. It's it's a lot of committees, and and you know I think the most complex assignment that I have is on healthcare appropriations. And, you know, the base budget for healthcare appropriations last session was about $30, uh, $30 billion, which is close to 40% of our $90 billion budget. I mean, it's, that's, uh, uh, that's, a, that's a tremendous amount of money. And when you, when you look at trying to, you know, uh, I'm sure your listeners know that in Florida we have a balanced budget requirement. We cannot spend more revenue that we t- than we take in. But when you look at healthcare and you try to sort of uh, cut and save and reallocate, reprioritize funds, uh, that is one area that's very challenging to to carve money out of because you're really affecting, uh, you know, there's no good place to take money. Do you take it from disabled children? Do you take it from seniors? Do you take it from Alzheimer's research? Uh, when you squeeze one into the balloon, it pops out somewhere else. So that's an extremely challenging uh, committee to be on. You know, you've touched on this. You vote on a lot of difficult and complicated issues in your hearings. Do you have a set of principles that guide your decision making? I, I do. I, I think the... I have sort of a rubric that I analyze every bill through. Um, it's like a three-part test. I, I look at the I look at the bill and I ask myself first of all, do we have um, do we have jurisdiction to to take this action legislatively that we're trying to take? And if we do, I, I move on to what is the most important part of that analysis for me is is this constitutional? And uh, if the measure is not constitutional, then for me that's that's an automatic no vote right there. And then the third thing I look at is does this bill if this bill were implemented, does it really accomplish what it seeks to accomplish? And what are the unintended consequences of, the, of this bill? May it do more harm than good in the long run? I've seen you vote nay on some issues in committees, and you were the only one to do so. When you have a situation where you are alone on a vote, does it ever make you doubt yourself? Bro, let me tell you, you have certainly done your homework on me. Yes, there were several times uh, in my first session that I was the only Republican, uh, in some cases the only member of either party to vote no on some of the bills, both in committee and on the floor. Does that give me self-doubt? I would say absolutely not. I think what would give me self-doubt is if I'm ever not voting my conscience. And you know, one of the challenges of, of this is that there is a tremendous amount of pressure sort of to, to go along, to get along here. And you know, there can be some consequences of being the only no vote on some of these things, and, and that's something that I'm continuously learning you have to really pick which hills you're willing to die on because a, a no vote certainly will have consequences when your legislation comes up for a vote. But I'm going to do what I told those people I was going to do when I knocked on their doors. There's a, a vote that I think is not consistent with my principles. I feel compelled to vote no on it. I'm continuously learning that you know you have to pick those battles wisely. You can't die on every hill, and I don't. And those cases were, were isolated, and I'm trying to bring more of my colleagues around to my way of thinking. I did some reading up about you and learned that you've done a lot of volunteer work for children's organizations. Can you tell me why you gravitate to that work? Yeah, so I started out volunteering many years ago, well over a decade ago, with Big Brothers Big Sisters of Southwest Florida. Did that for several years. In law school, I ended up teaching a financial literacy course to kids aging out of the foster care system. I've been a guardian ad litem now for almost three years. I'm currently the court-appointed advocate for five children in the foster care system. And I recently got my foster care license over the summer. You know, I, I, just lo- I just love kids. I, um, I don't have any children. I would love to have some someday, and that helps me get my kid fixed. But, but I, th- I think also, you know, any measure of a great society is how we provide for the most vulnerable among us. And, you know, right, right now we have 24,000 children in the state of Florida that are in the foster care system, and, and they are, in many cases, children without voices and without choices. I love engaging and working with those folks and trying to do whatever I can to help them uh, and improve their situation in, in life. And, and it's just it's just something that I think gives my life meaning and purpose. I'm very passionate about child welfare. I know you recently became a foster parent. Can you tell us about the process of becoming a foster care parent? So, yes, I can tell you a little bit about the process and a little bit about the experience of actually having children in your home as a, someone who's never been a parent. So the process was pretty intense. It's a six-week, 18-hour in-person course, followed by an online component of, I think, 20 to 30 hours of online training. It's a very rigorous course. Standards, I was kind of surprised by how intense it was, but I understand the need to fully vet and fully train folks who are going to take care of children not their own. 
So over Thanksgiving week, I had my first placement. I got placed with two children, both under the age of three, both still in diapers. And for a non-parent, it was quite a trial by fire. I mean, I, I learned all about Paw Patrol and other kids' TV shows. I, I learned, you know, that you need an engineering degree to install some of these new car seats. I mean, that was <laughs> yes. something that was challenging uh, for me. I learned that my house was not quite as kid-proof as I had imagined, and I think I'm still finding food in crevices of my car that I never knew existed. I had them for a week. I do emergency shelter and respite care with my travel to the capital. I can't do full-time foster, but I do what I can. But it was fun. It was a lot of fun. The, the thing that those kids wanted most was my attention, and I gave that to them. Bringing a child into your home is a big life change. What factors did you consider when deciding to go down this path? I don't know. Sometimes I don't know what I was thinking of. No, I, I think for me, this was sort of the next step on a on a, what may be a glide path to eventual adoption. I mean, you know, doing the uh, doing the volunteer work with Big Brothers and the Guardian Ed Lightem and now uh, serving as a foster parent. I'm 42 now. I'm not getting any younger, certainly. And I think that I may consider uh, the next step of, of actually full-time fostering and maybe adoption at some point in the future. Raising children and being responsible for their well-being has profoundly changed my life and perspective. How has this foster parent experience changed you? The sense of vulnerability that you see in these children, I think in all children, but particularly in these cases where children really do not have a parent that is willing or able to be their protector and be their provider. I mean, these children are very vulnerable. Some of them have been through, you know, traumatic experiences that most adults will never even encounter. It's just amazing how much you learn about these individual children even after just spending a few days or a week with them, you know what their favorite foods are, how they like to be held and rocked and, and put to bed, what stories they like to read. And you develop this sort of protective sense that I think probably every parent feels for their own children. And then when they leave your care, you sort of think, okay, well, does this new person that they're going to stay with know how they like to be rocked? Do they know what they like to eat? You develop, just develop a concern for these, these kids and you, you're sort of afraid for them in, in, in a little bit. So um, it, it was it was a neat experience, and, and I can see where you can quickly develop an emotional bond with these children that can be hard to let go of once they leave your care. There may be someone listening to this podcast that has considered opening their home to a foster child that has hesitated. What would you tell them? Oh, man. Listen, so one of the, we have a critical shortage in the state of Florida uh, of foster care parents, and uh, I would encourage you to go to an informational seminar, which a lot of the community-based care providers hold on a regular basis, probably monthly, to learn about what, what it takes to be a foster parent. Even if you just want to dip your toe in the water and do what I'm doing and do short-term emergency placement or respite care, we desperately need you. And, and the 24,000 children in dependency care in the state of Florida desperately need you. And I'm a firm believer that the government makes a terrible parent. So if we can get these children you know, out of group homes and into foster home, we really need to do that for them. So please, if you're out there and you're thinking about it, we need you. Please step up and, and get involved. We need your help. Can you share with us what your parents were like and what your home life was like growing up? Born into a, uh, a family of plumbers, fourth generation family owned plumbing company. I worked with my dad and, and his brothers during the summers doing work. I was their helper and I was always the smallest. So I was always the one that had to crawl under houses. I absolutely hated it at the time, but it gave me a profound respect for one, the value of learning a trade and then, and then I think work ethic too. But, you know, I grew up in probably your normal probably lower middle class family, great family. I'm very close with my parents. I have two siblings. I'm the oldest of three. I never had to want for a meal or a roof over my head, but uh, we, we certainly were not in a position to take a lot of vacations and do stuff like that. But, you know, I love my parents and they instill me with great values. And, and working in the foster care system, I'm profoundly grateful to my parents and the childhood that they were able to give me and whatever petty grievances I, I had against my parents as a teenager quickly evaporate when you see some of the situations that these kids are living in. But I remain close to my siblings. Uh, my parents live about 20 minutes away from me in South Florida. I see them on a regular basis, and I thank God every day that they're still in good health. How did your parents meet? They met in college. You know, that's a question I've never really specifically talked to them about where and how they met, but they met in college. Our family is from uh, Northwest Louisiana. I'm not a Florida native. I don't know many people that are, but they met at uh, Northwestern State University in Louisiana. And yeah, that's, that's where they met. You entered the military quite young. Why did you choose a military life for yourself? Well, I don't think that I entered the military quite young. I entered the military just shortly before my 19th birthday, which in the military is pretty normal. I mean, you're kind of considered a, one of the older guys in the military when you get to about 28 to 29. And I think that level of responsibility 
you know, was quite normal 30, 40, 50 years ago. It's not quite as normal today, but there is no question that the military has shaped my self-identity and it has great import on on the way that I conduct my life. It was it just it was just great, you know, in terms of developing character, work ethic, lessons on integrity and the camaraderie that you make. Uh, I forget the actual question that you just asked me, Ro, but I could I could go on and on about about the military, but it, it is fundamental towards shaping my worldview, my perspective and my my identity. Why I chose the Coast Guard, I served for 20 years in the Coast Guard, retired in 2016, some of the best years of my life. I was a lifeguard all through high school, which got me interested in the water rescue aspect of the Coast Guard. And uh, listen, I'd give you three reasons why I think the Coast Guard is just amazing. We need all services to accomplish the mission uh, of the United States of America, conduct our foreign policy, protect the homeland. But with the Coast Guard, they're, they're focused on search and rescue, which is the number one mission set of the Coast Guard. I looked at that and I always thought that if given a choice, I'd rather save someone than shoot them. And that was something that the Coast Guard did. You know, it's a more humanitarian service, I guess I would say. The second reason is, you know, you knew you were going to live by a beach somewhere. That appealed to me. And the third, I think the Coast Guard is really the only service that executes their mission every day. And what I mean by that is that many of the services spend a lot of time training and training and training and training, sort of wargaming out uh, scenarios that may never happen. And we want them to be ready for that scenario if and when it does happen, certainly. But the Coast Guard, you're training and you're executing that mission every day, whether it's search and rescue, uh, maritime law enforcement, narcotics interdiction, or alien interdiction at sea, uh, you are doing that mission every day. Love the Coast Guard. Semper Paratus to anyone in the Coast Guard that's listening. You have a number of medals from your two decades of service to our military. Is there one medal or distinction that you are most proud of? I haven't given that much thought, but if I, I guess if I were to just answer that question, one of the things that I was privileged to do at the end of my tour on Coast Guard Cutter Midget back in the late 90s, early 2000s, I did a combat deployment with the Midget to the, to the Middle East. This was in the run-up to the Second Gulf War. And I got sort of my first really, got a, a Navy and Marine Corps a commendation medal at the end of that tour, which was very unusual for a Coast Guard and enlisted man to get a Navy commendation medal. I think that really is the most meaningful one for me. I was a junior enlisted at the time. I was a, I just just got promoted from E4 to E5, and um, I worked very hard on that patrol. And I was really surprised to see them recognize me in that way. So I think that probably is the most significant uh, for me. And I think the time my time on that ship was really just foundational towards you know, my development personally and professionally. You participated in the Judge Advocate General Program, better known as JAG in the Coast Guard. Can you explain to our listeners what JAG is and the types of work you did in the military? Yes. And let me just say from the outset that I believe the military is an organization that is still a 100% meritocracy-based organization. And when you join the military, look, I joined, I didn't know anyone, I didn't have any connections. Uh, If you work hard and play by the rules, there is really no limit to what you can accomplish. The military paid for my undergraduate degree, and I got to travel all around the world, made some great friends. And then towards the, I guess, the midpoint of my career, I was enlisted for 10 years, went to OCS at my 10-year mark. And then after my first operational tour as an officer, I applied for the Judge Advocate Program, and they paid for me to go to law school. They, They paid for me to attend private law school at University of Miami. There's no way I could have afforded to go there on my own. And in return for that, I agreed to practice law for the Coast Guard as a judge advocate, which is just a military lawyer for a number of years. And I did that until I retired. So uh, I felt like I had really three careers in one, you know, as an enlisted man, and then as a junior officer operational, and then as a lawyer. But it's just absolutely great. And any time that you can get your education paid for without incurring significant student loans, I would encourage anyone to pursue that. And I I think if many young people were more aware of the opportunities uh, that the military offered, there would just be droves of people rushing to join. I just, I don't think those are well publicized, but uh, but it was great for me personally, and I enjoyed serving as a judge advocate. You've talked about being deployed. Tell us where you went and how you cope with the changes and stress that go along with that. Well, at, at the time that I was deployed in the Middle East, I was much younger. I think I was 21 years old at the time, and it was a great adventure. I think during that deployment, we must have stopped or spent time in 15 different countries. I loved the travel. I, I loved learning about other cultures. And I loved feeling that I was playing a part in conducting the, you know, both the defense and, and executing the foreign policy decisions of the United States government. You know, at the time, I don't think I really, I really thought much about it other than I'm seeing new places. I'm with my friends. This is a really cool job. You know, look forward to more. But I think one thing that that did, and one of the reasons I joined the military was because you know, I had really never traveled as a child. We really weren't able to travel much outside of our state, or certainly I never went anywhere internationally until I was a a young adult in the military. And that really sparked for me a travel bug. 
And since then, I have gone on to travel extensively and, and for long periods of time, long chunks of time on my own all over the world. What are some of the lessons, I think you've touched on this a bit, that you've learned during your military career that you think are still relevant to your work and life today? Well, one of the things that I spoke about at my retirement ceremony, and I think is still the most important lesson that I've learned in the military, is how to be a good dishwasher. And uh, that always elicits a chuckle when I'm talking about it. But what I mean by that is, you know, when I joined the military as an, an 18-year-old kid, I had no education and I had no skill set. And my job for the first three months of service was to wash dishes and clean bathrooms and iron clothes for the officer corps on the ship. That was a job. I looked at that at the time as that was what I was qualified to do, all I was qualified to do. And that's what the United States government needed me to do. And I took a, a lot of pride in doing that. Many of my colleagues that joined at the same time that I did seemed to feel that many of those tasks were somehow beneath them and they were saving their best work ethic for a, a more glorious assignment that was more worthy of their efforts. And I, I never took that, that attitude and many of those folks that embraced that attitude of this is work is beneath my dignity ended up staying and doing that work much longer than I did. And some did repeat tours. But I was proud to say and to say now that, you know, the effort and energy and pride that I put into scrubbing a toilet was the same effort, pride and attention to detail that I would put into writing a legal brief 20 years later. And I think that work ethic doesn't change with, with your assignment or the tasks that you're given. And I, I think that every job has the equivalent of a dishwasher. And when you start at an entry-level job, whether it's as an intern in the political process or, or in the military or any other job, I think you know, it's sort of a, a lost ideal to, to do your best at every single assignment that you're given because it is important, grand scheme of, of what you're doing and in, in the organization. So a little long-winded there, but, uh, but uh, I still think that most fundamental lesson I learned uh, was how to be a good dishwasher. On your campaign website, you talk about scuba diving. When did you get into scuba diving? I think I got certified in my early 20s uh, down in South Florida when I discovered South Florida for the first time. And I was actually sent here by the Coast Guard, fell in love with the place and with Florida's natural environment. I love to do that. And it's also a great travel sport, you know, if you're, if you're interested in diving. And the cool thing about Florida is in the Florida Keys, I mean, you don't have to go deep to see a lot of really cool stuff in the Keys. I mean, sometimes even 16, 20, 30 feet, you're on the bottom. You don't have to do a lot of deep dives that are going to expose you to risk of, of decompression when you come up. Florida is just a great place to do that and, and really experience nature. I have not done the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, but that's on my bucket list. Do you have a favorite spot? scuba dive? For scuba diving, I've done two dives that I thought were really cool. One was in Belize and the other one was in Mexico. And in Mexico, they have these underwater rivers called cenotes. And I did a dive in an underwater river, which is essentially a, an underground cave system, which was the most exhilarating and the, the most frightening adrenaline-based thing I've ever done. I'm not sure that I would do it again. I certainly would never recommend or maybe allow a child to do it because it was, um, it was really scary, but it was exhilarating to do that. You've traveled extensively through Central and South America. If someone were planning a trip there, where would you tell them to go? And what are the can't-miss places in Central and South America? So that's an easy question for me, Ro. Uh, of all of the places that I've traveled to internationally, I've never been back to the same city more than once, with the exception of Antigua, Guatemala, which I've actually been to nine times now since I discovered that place in, uh, in I think, 2009. It is the absolute crown jewel and gem of Central America. It is a very quaint colonial city with just enough Western conveniences for Western tourists to enjoy it, uh, but it still has the colonial feel to it. It's a it's 10 by 10 city blocks. You can walk everywhere. You'll still see uh, horse-drawn carriages. It is an absolutely magical place. It's very safe. I actually took my nephew when he was 10 years old. I took him with me there for two weeks and put him in a Spanish immersion school for two weeks. It's just a great place. If you're looking for a, a great place to take your family or to go adventure on your own, Antigua, Guatemala, you will not be disappointed. It is a, just a magical place. Do you speak Spanish? My Spanish is pretty decent. I'm not fluent. I would certainly say that I'm proficient, but I say that uh, aprendí español en la calle. I, you know, I, I learned uh, sort of on the street by just hearing and, and speaking. I haven't been shy about trying to use it. And I, I did go to law school in Miami, and so I had three years to sort of practice there. But I'm still learning every day. I try to watch some, uh, some news in Spanish uh, to train my ear a little bit more. I now have a legislative aide who is bilingual, so he's helping me as well. But my Spanish is, is decent, but I'm still learning. We like to end our show with a little fun by asking all of our guests the same seven questions. What would people be surprised to know about you? 
I don't know. I, I think one thing that people would be surprised to know that if I were not doing this right now in politics, my other passion or dream job would be to be a teacher. And I, I think either a teacher of like civics and history, which I love, or English lit, which I also love. In fact, when I was in high school, my dream was to be an, an author, was to write write books, and I still want to write a book at some point. But I, I love I love literature. I love English literature. I love talking about it. I, I, and I think maybe one day, still in this life, I could I could do that. When you have guests in town, where is your favorite place to take them? When I have guests in in town in my district, there's a fantastic new restaurant that has opened in North Fort Myers called Rosie Tomorrow's. It's been there for about three or four years now, but it is. We have actually people coming all the way from Miami just to check out this restaurant. It's it's an old barn that the owners, Gary and Rose, have in, converted into this outdoor open-air restaurant that's really reminiscent of something you may find in, in Europe. But it's a really neat place. If you're ever in North Fort Myers, go check out Rosie Tomorrow's. And then, of course, when guests come in town, I love taking them to the beach. I mean, we have Sanibel Island in Lee County, which is consistently voted one of the top 10 beaches in the United States of America. So uh, I love Florida's outdoor environment. It's great. We have some great national parks. Uh, in that area as well. In fact, our our whole team just did a swamp walk down in Fakahatchee Strand, a little bit south of where I live. Just really neat experience. So South Florida is great. There's lots to do in South Florida besides uh, just Orlando and Miami. What is the name of a book you recently read that you could not put down or the name of a show you enjoyed binge watching? I'm a, an avid reader. I, I read two books in the last month. I've kind of been starving for good literature, but some friends gave me two books and it's been a long time since I've read a book cover to cover. I, I read this book. I stayed up all night reading it for 10 hours straight. I finally closed it, finished it at 6 a.m., and I had a meeting at 7 a.m. First time in a long time I stayed up that late all night. But it was a book called Educated by Tara Westover. And it's about her childhood in rural Idaho. You know, she grew up with parents who did not trust, really believe in the government. She never went to public school, didn't even have a birth certificate, was completely off the grid. And it's about her sort of experience growing up that way and then her emergence into society. And now she's a PhD. The second book that I read all night also was a book by a man named Sean Hopwood. It's called Lawman. And Sean Hopwood is now sort of a criminal justice reform advocate, but he spent uh, 12 years in federal prison for bank robbery and then uh, got out, got his law degree. He's now a Georgetown law professor. Fascinating book. I'd recommend uh, both of those books to anyone listening to this podcast. You will, you will not be able to put them down. Among your close family and friends, what are you best known for? I think my sense of humor. I can find humor in almost any situation. I try not to take things or myself too seriously. If you can't laugh at yourself or just kind of live in the moment, and then if you make a mistake, just kind of move on to the next thing and don't constantly self-critique or, or lose sleep over what, what has been. I think most people that know me well, which may not always be apparent in, in my public life, would tell you that I do have a, a great sense of humor. If you have a nickname, who gave it to you? You don't have to divulge the nickname unless you want to. I don't know that I have a nickname. Some of my fellow legislators from South Florida, from, from Miami, call me La Cucaracha. But other than that, I don't really have, have a nickname. If you knew you could not fail, what would you attempt? Oh, gosh, that's a good question. If I knew I could not fail, I'd probably go out and pick some Powerball numbers and cash in and win the lotto. There's several things on my bucket list that I still want to do before I check out. I want to hike. Kilimanjaro. I have yet to dive the, the blue hole in Belize. I, I want to do that. And one of my New Year's resolutions is actually to get out, of, get out and do more outdoors things, more fun things. Uh, you know, sometimes this job can be all consuming. I haven't actually taken a trip, even a weekend, short weekend trip since I started campaigning almost two years ago. I mean, there just is never a good time to do that. And I'm, I'm learning that you just got to make time to do that. But yeah, a lot of. What are the top three things you love about living in Florida? So I think, you know, I've talked a little bit today about Florida's, what makes Florida unique, it's a sunshine state, is our marine environment. I mean, whether you're down in the Keys or whether you're on any one of our beaches, I just think Florida has so much to offer in terms of just our natural environment. I mean, I, I'm a sun worshiper. There's nothing that I like better than blue, clear skies, white sand, and, and blue water. I mean, it's great. I wish I could spend more time fishing. But one of the times when I really appreciate Florida, and this may sound odd, is when it's late at night or super early in the morning and I'm driving in the car and there are no other cars on the road, it's quiet. I love to roll down the windows and just feel that Florida warm air and hear the sounds of Florida's natural environment and look around and see palm trees on a deserted Florida highway when either you're getting in from the airport on a late flight or going to the airport in the early morning. I love that and that just it just makes it feel like home. Representative Roach, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you today. 
Ro, thank you. I've really enjoyed it. And uh, we'll see you next time. This episode of the Floridaville was recorded in Tallahassee, Florida, and edited by Joy Toodle with Rocket Ship Consultants. Be sure to like The Floridaville on Facebook and follow us on Instagram. We are always looking for new guests to feature, so be sure to email us your ideas. Our email is feedback at thefloridaville.com. Thanks for listening.